Good morning. Good morning. I'm uh, so grateful to be here this morning. I'm Dr. Joanne Braxton, president of the Braxton Institute in partnership here with Plymouth Church, UCC. So glad to be uh, with you, Dr. Brown and Reverend uh, Metcold, and uh, your congregation has extended an extravagant welcome to us, and we're grateful today to be able to bring a little bit of our East Coast love <laughs> to the rain of Pacific in the person of Reverend Dr. Yvonne Dell, who blessed us with a magnificent sermon yesterday. We had inspiring and lively worship, and uh, it was a beautiful, beautiful thing. Uh, I could introduce you again in a no. traditional way. No, you don't. <laughs> How, however, Mother Gell, uh -oh. <laughs> a, 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 a little bird told me that um, you've got another lifetime award just this weekend. You haven't mentioned that to me. So I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you what was this uh, award you received in, in New Haven last week, Fernando? Please tell us a little bit about it. Anna. If you live long enough, <laughs> Amen. And God blesses you to be able to survive in the midst of all that we find ourselves moving through. I returned to the Hill, Andover Newton Theological Seminary, that I entered in the year 1961 mm. to be equipped to receive the Master's of Religious Education Award, a, a degree, Master of Religious Education degree. And I was invited back 60 years later, after Andover Newton is no longer on a hill where it used to be um, in um, Newton Center, Massachusetts, but it's now in a relationship with Yale Divinity School and New Haven. And so its home now is alongside of Yale. And, and so I was invited back 60 years later to in fact receive the Spirit of the Hill Award. <laughs> and it is someone who embodies uh, the spirit of Andover Newton as it seeks to equip um, those who are able uh, to be a part of its journey for ministry uh, in the world. And so I was very honored after 60 years uh, to be able to come back to a place which for me was symbolized by the hill. I won't take a long time because this will wrap it all up. But you have to imagine, and 60 years ago, and of Newton, you had to climb a hill in order to get to all that was essential to the life of that school. Mm. But women were at the bottom of the hill. Mm. All of the women, there were only 13 women in 1961 wow. who were enrolled at Andover Newton Theological Seminary. Only one African American, myself, <laughs> in that class of 1961. Mm. The housing for the women was at the bottom of the hill. Oh, wow. And everything else, the chapel, the classrooms, the cafeteria, the administration, everything else at the top of the hill. And so for women, it was a climb from the bottom of the hill <laughs> to the top of the hill <laughs> and order. And so the symbolism of what that represented in the year of our Lord, 1961, faculty all male and all white, no female um, on the faculty. And at that moment, not very much to remind me of who I was at the top of the hill. Ooh. Another whole world at the top of the hill. And yet, it was the expectation that if I could climb that hill and move into that arena, that there was something big that would equip me for the journey that I would be engaged in. 
And I think the spirit was, I survived. <laughs> I survived. And yes. the climb, I survived the climb up the hill. I survived in a context that was really very male theology taught from a Euro's perspective in the context of it. And yet, in that place, with all that was there, there was something else that was there. And that was the ability to be able to see through the strands of theology. That would, so the minute I would go into the Old Testament class and start connecting to a story of how you survive oppression, beginning from the very beginning. The Bible was a whole book for folk mm -hmm. trying to find their way out from under oppression. Mm -hmm. And so I had to bring myself into it. Mm -hmm. I could not wait for it. And so I had to write the narrative out of the context of where. I had to write myself into Andover Newton, not wait for Andover Newton to mm -hmm. come back. And the moment that I was able to do my student um, service work and that they had a whole moment that you could sign up to go from the hill right into Roxbury. And in Roxbury, a team of us became a team to work along with our sisters and brothers who were Muslim and who were a part of uh, Elijah Muhammad's uh, family who were working in that area. And it was an ecumenical movement with us working there to respond to the needs of families and young people in the midst. And that's where the, the whole seminary came alive for me, right. to be able to work with sisters and brothers from another faith, to be able to figure out how we could be in that place, breathing life and receiving life from, in fact, the um, brothers and sisters who were there in that place. They were my soul saving station. And so to be able to have worship, not on the top of the hill, but in the city of Roxbury alongside and in partnership with others. That was an amazing reality. So my feeling is that when they invited me back again, not so much then when I came, they probably saw me as a cup that needed to be filled. When I came back, they invited themselves to say, we the cup, we'd like for you now to in fact offer your wisdom, your understanding of where we are. So yes, I received the spirit of the hill award, mm -hmm. 60 mm -hmm. years after. <laughs> Mother Del, mm -hmm. there could not be a better introduction to mm -hmm. today's dialogue on resisting mm -hmm. and thriving. <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much for sharing your journey and welcome to all those who are here to our conversation about not just surviving, yeah, but thriving but thriving, and you've been resisting and thriving for a long time. And in accordance with the conversation that we had just this morning, Dr. Rebecca Parker is going to give us a call for today's conversation. And then we'll have a moment of centering music that echoes that call. So mm -hmm. in, in your honor, Mother Del, I'm going to read you from another theological school on another hill, mm -hmm. Star King School for the Ministry, mm -hmm. uh, which I served as president for 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm on Holy Hill, Holy it's Hill. called in Berkeley. That's right. And uh, mm -hmm. Andrew, who's also here, All went right. to Pacific School of Religion across mm -hmm. the street. Yeah. It's all these schools working together at the Graduate Theological Union in those years. And I'm going to read you a piece I wrote for the school's catalog, a call inviting people to consider coming to theological school. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So you spoke yesterday of our call. Yes. The call that comes when we're perhaps young and naive, and the call that comes after we have been through yeah. the valley of the shadow of death, yeah. the experience of facing yeah. risk, yeah. the sorrow of knowing we have betrayed yeah. our values, and then we're still called. Yeah. yeah. So in your honor, and because you use this phrase so much, in the midst of the world. Mm. <laughs> in the midst of a world marked by tragedy and beauty, 
there must be those who bear witness against unnecessary destruction and who with faith rise and lead in freedom with grace and power. Mm -hmm. There must be those who speak honestly mm -hmm. and do not avoid seeing what must be seen of sorrow and outrage, of tenderness and wonder. There must be those whose grief troubles the water, mm -hmm. while their voices sing and speak refreshed worlds. There must be those whose exuberance rises with lovely energy that articulates Earth's joys. There must be those who are restless for respectful and loving companionship among human beings, whose presence invites people to be themselves without fear. There must be those who gather with the congregation of remembrance and compassion, draw water from old wells, and walk the simple path of love for neighbor. And there must be communities of people who seek to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God who call on the strength of soul force to heal, transform, and bless life. Mm -hmm. There must be religious witness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. And we can take a moment now and enjoy the musical composition that accompanies this beautiful poem. Let us open our hearts and prepare for our conversation.
Oh, yeah. And the cellist was. The students commissioned that music for me. The Seattle composer, Carol Sams. Beautiful. Who is the Seattle? Carol Sams. And when I look at the students in the choir, I see uh, senior ministers of major metropolitan uh, churches. I see the president wow. of the Unitarian Universalist <laughs> Association, and I see sainted friends who've gone on to join the ancestors. So mm -hmm. that was indeed a moment. As this is a moment, mm -hmm. and Mother Del, we have drawn you here into this small congregation of, of witnesses mm -hmm. who do draw water from old wells mm -hmm. and attempt in every way to walk the simple path of love for the neighbor in Rebecca's words. And among this community of people who are seeking to walk this path and who have committed themselves, committed ourselves to bear religious witness, there is much need in the midst of a world. And I know you have come with questions for us to stimulate a dialogue, and it is yours to begin. Thank you. Thank you. And Rebecca, what wonderful, wonderful words to remind us, to remind us of where it is that we are and what we seek to become, where we are and what we seek to become. My fear sometimes is we've lost sight of where we really want to go. Mm. Because we're so entangled in the context of where we are with so much that takes us away from the vision of wholeness, so much that takes us away from the understanding of what it means to be the beloved community, so much that causes us to fight to just protect ourselves and arm ourselves from the harm that we feel each and every day that's around us when you feel that the place where you are is really a strange place. It is not home. It is a strange place that you are seeking to really, in fact, find your way uh, into. And so you lose sight sometimes because you're fighting for survive. You can't thrive because you're fighting just to survive. You're fighting for your name. You're fighting for your dignity. You're fighting for your honor. You're fighting. For, and so in that context of it, you lose sight of what can really be home. And so to hear those beautiful words and to figure out that in fact there are, there is, there's the possibility of it and that we have to make it just like I had to climb the hill mm -hmm. 60 years ago and find in that place elements that could be that could be home, and so I thank you. And I'm grateful for all of the folk who are sitting here. I always believe that whoever is there is who's meant to be there. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. wish for whoever else didn't. I'm grateful <laughs> for the king. I'm grateful for the ones who are present in our midst. And so I want to pause for a minute and let you name yourself again, call your name again, because a part of old age is that I, in the midst of everything, Start forgetting names. I don't know if anybody else. Oh. <laughs> I, I, go, I mean, I was, in, I was in worship yesterday, and I was trying to think of the name of the gymnast who was so wonderful and been doing so many wonderful things. I couldn't think of her name. It was just a frozen. But you know, the names go and yeah. come. But it is important that every time we gather, we still gather in recognition that we're not just occupying seats. But we come in the fullness of who we are. Yes. And it's important for us to name ourselves. So I'd like for you to name yourself before I start into this moment with you. And I'm going to start over there 
even with the one who is orchestrating and helping us to get all of the filming done and all that we have. Welcome to this community as well. well thank you. Uh, so I'm Reverend Kevin Bechtold, the associate pastor here. Um, and it just so happens that a lot of my responsibilities these days fall to tech, but I'm pleased to be here with you. <laughs> Uh, my name is Reverend Andrew Conley Holcomb. I'm the pastor of a small neighborhood church, one of three UCC churches in West Seattle, um, called the Admiral Church. Glad to be here. Oh, my name is Doug. <laughs> I'm glad to be here as well. <laughs> my name is Michael Gordon. Uh, I've been a member seven years, eight years. Something like that. Uh, <laughs> council member. Uh, all in all, I think uh, I'm just a uh, good disciple. <laughs> you know, uh, to make bridges right here in Plymouth with uh, BIPOC people and the long time members. I'm Kelly Brown. I'm senior pastor here. I'm grateful to be um, in ministry with many of the folks in this um, room in a variety of ways. So welcome to this place. I'm Jim Halfaker, a uh, member of Plymouth Church. Uh, in 1962, I graduated from Yale Divinity School, <laughs> in the place you were talking about. <laughs> Louisa, my wife, lived in Porter Hall with 40 other I think all white women, yeah. and they were below the chapel, so they had to go a little uphill. Oh, wow. <laughs> but it that brought was... back all kinds of memories oh, wow. from that period mm -hmm. when you shared your recent visit. Your honor was during the annual convocation, I think, at, at Yale and at Overdue. Yeah. Right? And uh, my seminary education, like yours, was with all white men teaching and hero centered. Mm -hmm. But one of the few more things I had was with Ed Edmonds, the pastor of Dixwell Avenue Church, oh, an all black church. Yes. I had an internship there, yeah. which was intentional, which changed the direct trajectory of my mm. race and justice oriented part. So oh. I brought back some great history when you great shared that. Yeah. I'm so glad you're here. Yeah. Oh. I'm Reverend Dr. Elizabeth Gordon. Uh, I'm uh, in covenant with Plymouth Church, mm -hmm. uh, and I am a staff chaplain uh, at Providence Mount St. Vincent in West Seattle, and also a per diem chaplain at the University of Washington Medical Center. I'm very glad to be here. <laughs> I'm Rebecca <clears throat> Ann Parker Braxton. A baptized, blessed, <laughs> broken, transformed, healed, and called <laughs> child of God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, excuse me, here today on behalf of the Braxton Institute <clears throat> as a member of the board <clears throat> and as a friend of the Plymouth UCC congregation. <laughs> I'm <clears throat> Reverend Joanne Braxton. Um, President of the Braxton Institute, <coughs> child of the Southern Conference, <laughs> proud graduate of PSR and Yale. <laughs> I do uh, remember Dixwell oh, Avenue you Church. Mm -hmm. I lived on Lake Place behind the gym. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I was not in the um, I was not in the Divinity School. Um, I was in the American Studies program. Mm -hmm. However. I did go to some very fine parties at the beginning of the So, um, and shared classroom space with people like uh, James Washington uh, under the direction of Reverend. I'm going to give John Blass again uh, an ordination that he hadn't received, but <laughs> maybe came from a higher power and he uh, left us enjoying the ancestors in the, in the classroom of historian John Glass again. 
himself. Mm. That was quite a classroom, as you can imagine. Mm. And I'm Mother Yvonne Jock. Mm. <laughs> and I am so pleased in the 84th year of my life to be living into and feeling the responsibility of and celebrating the anointing of my role now as elder and mother. And as elder and mother. And I've had to go through many steps to get to this point, uh, but now I'm here. And I am grateful to God that I am in this place, uh, settling into um, my role as elder and mother in Revelation. They said, who are those folks who are coming? They're, they're all dressed in robes and everything right. and so forth. Who are those folks? <laughs> and they said, those are folks that have been through something. That's right. They're coming through great trials and tribulations, right. Right. That's right? But they're coming to this place. And mm. they come to this place out of the trials and tribulation mm. to offer a word about what it means mm. uh, for us to be, to be. And so I'm one of the elders who've been through many trials and tribulations. And but I've come through a wonderful journey that the United Church of Christ is just beginning. Uh -huh. To understand. We've been there all along. I mean, I've been a part of the Macedonia Afro Christian Church since my mother walked in pregnant with me in 1939. And that church was connected to the Christian part of our denomination. And so, in that sense, I've been a part of this connecting stream called the United Church of Christ for my entire life. I came right up out of it. Although my mother was Baptist and my father was First United Holiness, mm -hmm. by the time I came into existence for a number of reasons, they decided on Macedonia Afro-Christian Church. It was where both of those traditions mm. flowed into one place and the family could grow and be together in one church mm. there. And that was Macedonia Afro-Christian Church. And Macedonia Afro-Christian Church was a part of the Eastern Virginia Association. And the Eastern Virginia Association was a part of the Southern Conference now, but it was before that a part of the Afro-Christian Convention. Mm. It was the Afro-Christian Convention that, in fact, was the mother load to Macedonia and therefore became my experience shaping me into who I was called to be and flowing through me into the United Church of Christ. And even though I was there representing in many ways a stream of consciousness and understanding that had been there forever, many of those who were in leadership capacities could not see it. They saw me as an individual dismembered, dismembered from a stream that had flowed in the midst of it. And a part of what you do when you dismember is, in fact, this is my interpretation, Jim, and whoever else is listening, <laughs> that a part of the problem of the all of those who are flowing, either from religious or um, visioning or religious rootage or even an understanding of trying to do something great for God or even in the midst of just trying to be. They all had lost sight of what a beloved community all should look like. They never fully understood beloved community. And they didn't understand on the beloved community because most times we shape community in our own image. We shape God in our own image. We begin to affirm that in our image. And suddenly the way we envision it and the way that we shaped it, rather than to stand under it and be informed by that, be shaped by it, we shape it into our image. And then the image becomes the way in which we flow into the world. And even with that wonderful moment in 1957 when four predominantly white streams came together to unite on behalf of the brokenness that existed in the world and to proclaim the gospel to the world. They had a right direction. They were thinking right. However, they still saw it as moving from where they were and the understandings that they had brought into play at that time 
of what the beloved community ought to look like. It would be welcoming others into their understanding right. of what community. Yeah. And so in that sense, they were out to save the lost mm -hmm. and those who needed help finding their way into. And in many ways, um, at the time of 1957, we were struggling hard for civil rights in this country, struggling hard for this country to live up to its understandings of we the people uh, in this place, created in the image of God, everybody has a right to life, living in pursuit of happiness. And yet, even in this place, there was a severe crack in the foundation because you can't build a whole nation on a foundation that's got a crack in it. And the crack was we built a nation by occupying land that's that right. was already occupied <laughs> by people with lives and history and a relationship to the divine. Mm -hmm. who had already understood what life ought to be like. And at the same time that we had done that, and without fully consciousness in our own minds of the fact that we are occupying a land where already people are in existence in, we bring folk from another land in a horrible, inhumane system of enslavement. And we try to dehumanize them in order to justify what we have done in the midst of that. From the moment that you try to build on a foundation that has already been eroded, everything that you're building on it erodes as well. It erodes as well. And so in the context of that scenario, even with the United Church of Christ coming into existence in 1957, Nobody had clean hands coming into mm -hmm. it. And unless you can face your own disconnect, you face your own ways in which you are, in fact, a part of a system that is broken, you operate as if you are the beloved community. And so what happens is you invite others to come into a house that you have already created that's got a crack in it. Mm -hmm. You've invited others to come in. And the, 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 the piece of it that continues to flow is that the way in which many of those mothers and fathers envision um, those African Americans who were in their midst, whether they came in, and at the time of 1957, all of the African Americans who were entering the United Church of Christ came to one or two streams. The Christian church or the congregational. Mm -hmm. Not many came in from the ENR, yeah, Evangelical. Right, right, right. <laughs> Although I was so surprised to find Chester Marcus somehow connected to the ENR mm -hmm. side of it. And he had it, I'm talking about surprises, he had it, the, uh, the Office of, um, of Africa at that time, the World mm -hmm. Board uh, Secretary for Africa, was Chester Marcus. And he had roots in the ENR. Figure that. Well, there he was. But the majority of African Americans coming into the United Church of Christ came either through the congregational stream or the Christian stream. Those were the two ways that we entered this um, this merger. And those who entered through the congregational stream had primarily come through the AMA, the AMA, the American Missionary Association, who had fought horribly against enslavement and were struggling hard to end it and we're preparing anyway the whole Amistad story and all of that which is wonderful all of that and they were already preparing for in fact the end of slavery already and getting ready and they knew education was going to be critical going to be critical and so, so they started getting folk ready for white missionaries bless their hearts white missionaries to be able to flow from the north straight into the south and to create academies. Over 300 academies right. were created, mm -hmm. over 300. And missionaries, best of all, came from New England, came to, in fact, teach in those schools and worship. And they built chapels in those schools. Because, of course, at the core of our founding is our religious rootage that bless and sanctions everything we do, yeah. that bless and sanctions everything. So we worship, and out of the worship, we flow into those places where we can, in fact, do our work, and we come back to worship. So at the heart of those campuses were New England mm -hmm. worship centers, where the teachers worship, the principals worship. And then the students worship in that place. And suddenly, the students who were African 
American women. Start modeling their understanding of who they were after the very ones who were there. They wanted to be like the teachers and the students. They wanted to be like who you represented in the midst of everything. And so the strand that came through the congregational connection of Africans coming into the United Church of Christ were in Euro worship. Mm -hmm. yes. They worshiped just like the congregational worship. Mm -hmm. They had, in fact, left that stream of African worship because you got to survive somehow right. and you got to figure out who you are in the land that you are a part of. And so they came right up out of those schools and started worship centers and those worship centers were just like the worship centers in New England. They worshiped just like their teachers had worshiped in New England. But they had left something in order to gain something. They had left something. So here they are. Now you've got the second strand that's coming and those are us in the Afro-Christian strand. You either came through the congregational strand or you came through the Christian strand. And lo and behold, those Christians were something else. I mean, they were very evangelical. I mean, going all the way back to the Revolutionary War and everything, and coming out of this country, coming into existence. And we know if you don't have a moral base to that that country, you know, we're going to go to hell in the handbasket. And so here comes these revivals to, in fact, try to bring some moral authority and stuff into, the, into this picture. And with the, all the other groups coming came these Christians. I mean, very evangelical. All, telling me those, those camp meetings that they had were on fire. I mean, these were folk who were really in high praise and mold and, and relationship. And they, won't, they didn't want a whole lot of structure like this. We ain't had no bishops and all of that stuff. They wanted foundational stuff. They said, we, look, we just going to call ourselves, we want to be just like Christ. We want to be like Christ. Mm -hmm. And so, they, we going to say we Christians, all right? That's the name. That's sufficient for us. And we want to go to something basic, the Bible. That's it. We're going to be Christian. We're going to be Bible. No bishops telling us what to do. I uh, mean, we're going to be Christian. Bible is our basic authority. And our right to interpret the scripture is important. Right. Yes. All right? We ain't going to have just a few people interpreting the scriptures to us. We really do want to have the priesthood of all believers so that you have as much right of reading the scriptures and interpreting what it is saying to you. And together we will gather about our interpretation of scripture. So ain't no one person got us going on this market, priesthood of God. And then the other thing to say, your character is what, in fact, makes you an acceptable member. How you walk your walk, the way you walk your walk, your character is there. And then at the end, they believed in unity. Somehow, you know, they're not bad principles. They're not bad principles if you can adhere to those principles in an environment where, in fact, you're not called into question by another reality that might run straight through all of those affirmations that you make. If you're on a cracked foundation at some point, unless you can anchor those into a foundation that can hold it, and the only way you can do that is you've got to understand how the crack is there, and that there's something that is pushing you against what you really intend and want to do. Well, those of us who are African, Americans who came through the Christian side of the marriage, our entry level in the South, which is where the Afro-Christian convention, because really the Christian uh, denomination as it unfolded, it was moving all over the place. And it was in many different places. It was up in the North, it was in the South, it was in many different places. And they were in dialogue and discussion about the crack. They knew that in fact, that issue that they were going to have to deal with somehow or other was the issue of enslavement. And that was the piece. And they all knew it. And they had these many discussions about it, the founding mothers and fathers of the Christian faith. But what you see is where you are located. Mm -hmm. And what your allegiance is, is dependent on where you locate. So for those who were up north, there was a discussion academic. But for those who were in the south, where they had already embedded themselves in a system that required that you build your house on a system that causes for the dehumanization of other folk. 
then we're going to have to deal with that. And in trying to deal with that issue, we enter. 1619, we enter, we enter, we enter. And as we enter from 1619, moving into a corrupt system already, looking for some hope in the midst of all of this stuff, revivals that come through, even when you're in enslavement, revivals of life that come through, folk coming through with energy, some people coming through with a celebration of Christ and celebration of God and what it means to have moral authority. And all of these churches who were Christian churches in the South who had enslavement, meaning they were owning men and women, if you can ever own a man and woman. Here they are trying to celebrate their allegiance to this faith they got while they're corrupted by the way in which they are dehumanizing. And so here are Africans. The first African, um, first church in the Afro-Christian church, in the Afro-Christian part of this merger that's coming, uh, the convention, it came um, in like 1850-something. And at that point, they were also, because Blacks uh, who were free connected to the Christian movement, not, because not all were enslaved. We had some free. Africans who, and, uh, who were here. And so the freed ones, they liked this Christian stream that was flowing through. Hey, Christ is on the head of the church. You got a right for interpretation, all of that. There's freedom in that, some freedom, and there's spirit in that. that was. And so even in the early, in like 1830s, 1850s, there were churches uh, that were African American churches that were composed of blacks and whites. Free coming together in one place uh, to witness uh, to the gospel. And so the first one we can talk about is in um, Providential United Church of Christ that came into existence in 1830s, 1840s during that time. But for most of those who were caught in the web of enslavement, their experience to the Christian church came through the masters. And those that the masters would allow into the plantation to, in fact, <clears throat> bring the word. And when they were organized in some fashion, of course, there were the balconies that we know about. And so, because you don't allow those that you have to humanize to sit with you and worship, ain't no way we're doing that because they're not human. They're not quite like we are. And so they put them in the balcony. So they're up in the balcony. But what they hear, they run through their lenses of home. What they feel, they run through the lenses of home. Because these are not persons who are empty, who are sitting That's there. Right. These are not persons who have no value. These are mothers and fathers who have a connection to a home base. Right. The place where they were taken from, their home base. So they're not sitting there in enslavement. They're sitting there in the authority of home, mm -hmm. the place that had given birth to them, the ways in which they live and feel and have their being. And so what they heard coming from a Christian evangelist who's on a plantation preaching the gospel and the good news to white mothers and fathers who are taking in all of this wonderful spirit and affirmation what they heard was something different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. They were preaching the same thing, whites over here, the masters mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. here. But what they heard, they ran through their lens of the homeland. Mm -hmm. It connected to the homeland. Freedom connected. Spirit connected to the homeland. Indicating that in that place where they were, they were already worshiping, but not the way they thought the folk who were there. Because the masters hoped that the religion would make them more obedient. Right. Because they were preaching, hey, slaves, obey your masters. Be obedient. Acquiesce to this new situation that you find yourself. Accept it. Be a part of it. But that's not what they heard. It ran through them into a tap root that they had. Mm -hmm. There was a tap root from motherland Africa. And they heard it through their lens. 
and their lands was God is still in this place. Right. And there's going to be a way in the midst of all of this that we're going to move out of this place <clears throat> into freedom. So while the masters might want them to be obedient to an environment that was dehumanizing, and what they heard was there's another home. And that home is going to be ready for you to be all that you envision that you can be. Another tap root saying freedom is on the horizon. There's a place that's not just like this. What they heard was some, and it was the tap root that they were still connected to. And immediately after the emancipation was all over, they themselves didn't wait for missionaries to come from the north to create life for them. They moved directly up out of that enslavement period and began to create churches. And the Afro-Christian convention was growing by leaps and bounds with persons coming out of enslavement, but with a vision of another way of living and being that had a connection to home. They founded them, founded churches. Churches were growing for everything because that was the place that could remember Mm -hmm. out of a system that dismembered. Yes. Yes. That was the place that could anchor and root you and connect you to something. Life did not begin with them in enslavement. It began with them on the motherland of Africa mm -hmm. where all of life was affirmed as sacred. Mm -hmm. They had another meeting place with the divine and it wasn't in the slave. They didn't meet God. Is it? it was their beliefs that took them through slavery mm -hmm. and enabled them to come back out of it into another place and space by which they could be. Afro-Christian convention coming on up out of And the churches that they created, they had to survive. They were all places because America was still a strange and alien land. And no matter how we moved out of enslavement, America was keeping enslavement in place. Mm -hmm. Jim Crow laws, legend, mm -hmm. separate but equal. America refused to acknowledge the crack, but built up and doubled down on the crack. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you got to have some places that is home. Got to have some places in the midst of an insane reality that is safe, that can affirm you, right. that represents home. Mm -hmm. And the black church mm -hmm. and the Afro Christian tradition, it was home. It was the place that said, in this place, remember who you are. Mm -hmm. You're connected to the God who declares all life is sacred. Mm -hmm. Remember, remember. And so the way we worship, we still were seen as part of the Christian denomination. Pulled up out of it, moved up out. we no more, you know, separation of the races. And with a whole, I grew up in my whole life in, Mass in Norfolk, Virginia, in separation of the races. You separate. We were not allowed. So now how can we be Christian? Adhere to a whole theology of separation mm -hmm. and be used to bless and anoint it if you wait uh, to say it's all right to still do it, it, it is unbelievable. however in those places those were places of life and freedom and hope those were places to help remember so when we walked up into those places mamas and daddies children and all there was a memory there of who they were and we reminded ourselves over and over again in this way. There was a way that we had the freedom to be who we could be. In enslavement, you had to be in a regiment. When you have free space, you can worship and celebrate and be all that God has called you to be. I think a lot sometimes about Toni Morrison's beloved and baby sucks holy. I think about the clearing. I think about the places that you got to bring folk to learn how to love again. How to love yourself in a world that is determined not to have you love yourself. How to love the folk who are given it. Where are the places where we can do that? And Tony Morrison, our artists, all of them, they understood the things. We got to learn how to love. We got to root back into a foundation that has meaning and hope. And the black church was with that place, the clearing, that place where we could gather, that reaffirmed who we were that reminded us Sunday after Sunday, no matter what laws they passed to dehumanize you in this place, 
you got to hunger. No matter how they are trying to, in fact, deny you every opportunity and right, you can't go to the same schools. You can't be in the same place. You can't be treated with dignity and honor. You can't. There is a place that has another narrative. It was the Afro-Christian connection. Organized churches for our survival, for our soul salvation in a world that was crazy, and our connection to home, a home base that had meaning. That was my home, the Afro-Christian convention. Separate now, it has pulled itself out. Whites didn't want them in the house. The whites, they said, now that we're free, ain't no way you coming back up in here and worship right. with us. Mm. We don't want you up in here. And we said to them, and we don't want them to be back up here. <laughs> right. Don't worry. We don't want them to be back up in here. Because there's a contradiction to everything that you're about and everything that you're saying. Mm -hmm. Truth is not there. No. That is not life for us. Mm -hmm. it's that. And so it pulled itself out, a separate entity. And the height of in the Afro-Christian convention that covered only North Carolina and Virginia pulled itself out from the white Christians in that geographic area, mm. pulled themselves out and set up a separate denomination, if mm. you will. Over 400 churches, 25, 35,000 members, own printed press, we don't trust. Mm. <laughs> you right, know, right, right, right. Right, the word for us. Mm. And see, and on all of those churches, guess what? Was the cardinal principles. In this church, Christ is on the head. Y'all ain't on no head. All y'all who tried to keep us in enslavement, you not having any say so in here. Christ <laughs> is the only head of this church here. And the Bible, I don't care what y'all saying, we going to the Bible, but taking our lens mm, right. from a place where we are to interpret, you interpret the Bible from where you are. Mm -hmm. You bring your interpretation to that Bible. And we interpret that from the Bible. And we got just as much right to understand what that scripture is all about. We don't need nobody coming in here and teaching. We can all gather in this thing. So the five cardinal principles of the Christian church became freedom words when you are processing it through a lens of freedom mm -hmm. and life and living, you hear what? Mm -hmm. And so the Afro-Christian convention then took all of those principles, moved through them with their African consciousness and appropriated it to their particular situation. So it wasn't like swallowing white religion when somebody said, well, hey, you're just a part of a white Euro. No, it wasn't. They moved their lens of life that they had gotten from the motherland. They moved their lens of what it meant to be community. I am because you are. Mm -hmm. Our understanding of life and connectedness that had been rooted in the motherland, but moved through the principles and then affirmed in a way that we could move forward in the midst of still a crazy and insane thing. So the cardinal principles were always on, on at Macedonia that I grew up in, there were the cardinal principles. And every time there was a racist accident or a racist reality that we were escaping ourselves from and we moved up in there, we interpret those as freedom words, freedom instructions, that which allows you to be free in a society that's determined that you will not have. I got just as much right to interpret, and I got a right to be here. And the church became the anointing and the sanctioning of our humanity. It became the affirmation, because you got to have it wash over you over and over. Because every time you step out of the door, you're back into insanity again. Mm, mm, mm. And there's got to be something that allows you to be whole. That's right. Mm. The signs are you free, and you made whole. Where can you be free and made whole when you're dealing with an insane reality that you got to deal with day for day for day? And they have doubled down on a definition of who you are that says you ain't worth it. You are not worth it. And the white church had doubled down in it because it did not accept its complicity in it so that here is the Afro-Christian Convention, 18, 
70, it comes into five conferences, 25, you know, 25,000 members on free the press. We send in, uh, missionaries to Africa and to the Caribbean. The Caribbean churches are in conversation with us. Pan-Africanism is going on among the oppressed in the midst of it. We're talking to each other. They are connecting. We are connecting uh, to each other. And we got a structure for survival. They knew I had to survive. They knew I had to survive. And so the structure of it was to create a plan of action for the survival of our youth, the survival of our women, the survival of I mean, the survival of the family. It was survival mode then. I was equipped, not by end of the I took the Afro Christian Convention principles into That's right. mm -hmm. Andover Newton. Right. I climbed the hill of Andover Newton with the Afro Christian Convention principles that allowed me to be able to walk that hill yeah. and survive yeah. in that hill, yeah. to survive the hill. They were equipping me, and they were also equipping me for a world where I was going to have that time to leave home and go into a stretch. I didn't want to go to end of a new night, I preferred to go to Virginia Union. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's where I wanted to go. And they said, no. We got to deal with this world that you are a part of. You're in a place now where, and it was people like a Purcell Austin, whose father was an Afro-Christian minister, where he was an Afro-Christian minister, to say there's another world we still got to deal with. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to leave home at some time, mm -hmm. which home has got to be in you. Mm -hmm. You're a missionary. The values yeah. that decide who you are, it ain't going to be at the top of the hill. Right. It's what's in you. We want you to know who you are in ways that you're not free to walk away from. That's right. And Afro Christian Convention instilled into me values, a way of looking at the world, gave me a tap. I wasn't going there to help them define who I was. Right. I was going there to try to repair the damage mm -hmm. that was being done day by day by day. And the context of not allowing us to see and recognize the humanity that's all around us. Now it took me a while in the midst of, I remember the first day I was there, the second week I was there, and the first month I was there, I called my mother, I said, send the ticket, I'm coming home. I ain't staying here. It's a strange and alien land. I don't get it. It's not in the worship. It's not in the professors. I don't see it. I'm not feeling it. And I'm going to lose my mind. Send the ticket. I'm coming back home. She said, no, you're not coming back home. Mm -hmm. There's a role for you. Mm -hmm. So I know she's today looking at me, said, didn't I tell you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> she, she saw me today. Yeah. I didn't. But yeah. in the world of the African understanding, yes. the past and the present and the future connect. Yes. Yes. They move in a yes. circle. Yes. The past, the present, the future, it moves like this. You can be here and see there. Mm -hmm. You can connect to it. It's a connected consciousness with those who have gone before, with those who are coming after, with those who are in the present now. It's another way of seeing and believing. Mm. Afro-Christian roots and connection. There was another assignment for me. My assignment would not be Virginia Union. Another assignment for me. I was going to be placed in the home of the United Church of Christ. Another assignment for me. I would be an elder, but an elder also in the United Church of Christ. Mm -hmm. From the moment my mother carried me in her womb and to Macedonia Afro-Christian, I had an assignment for a world and a church that would be a hard one and a one that would require that we find a way in the midst of the journey to breathe. Mm -hmm. I always had home. I could always come back home and touch the base. I could always be, and then the time the home came to me, and we had hallelujah time wherever I was, right. and we go back <laughs> to the midst of the thing. But the Afro-Christian convention for all of that was there in the life, Jim, of the United Church. Christ. And they didn't see it. They saw an individual 
but they didn't see the community that gave birth to the individual. They saw when that union came into being, there are people who need our help. They are objects of our mission. We're going to bring the good news to them as if they were empty cups with no sense of being a reality, needing help. They didn't see them as subjects that could bring life to them. They felt they had the word to bring. And it blinded them from recognizing that sitting in their midst all of this time were already life-giving source that could inform the uniting mm. and united. The gospel was already in place that could inform, but they couldn't see it. And a part of, I think, the struggle with the American Missionary Association is while they fought against slavery, they never felt that those that they were ministering to were equal to them. Yeah, right. They never saw them as equal mm -hmm. to them. They, in fact, were impositing into them mm -hmm. their lifeline. They couldn't see that they were here. <laughs> so we go through a long journey to a day in which as I entered, because it was my assignment to go home, to go send you out. So it's time now uh, to have put your wings on. You got to go. And you got to sojourn out there in the midst of it. There's a time that you come home. I'm coming home now. This is home time. But at that moment, it was moving in the midst of those moments with an assignment. And they kept saying, but lest you be careful, you might forget home. You might forget your home. You might forget. So don't sojourn so far that you forget you got a home baby. So they would pray over me. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They did anointing because the powers and principalities of injustice are great. Okay. You can you might want to really start casting your lot with them and, and mm -hmm. you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so it's in the context of having that tap root that was there. Constantly praying for me, and their prayers could reach me no matter where I was. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You don't have to be. The prayers are gone. They said the prayer warriors have called your name, mm -hmm. and they have a hallelujah time because they knew I needed to feel the spirit. Mm -hmm. And that's an understanding of spirit that comes out of the Afro Christian tradition. Mm -hmm. That spirit can move anywhere and everywhere, mm -hmm. it connects to you wherever you are. It's a way of thinking about life, it's a way of ordering your life around basic principles that were there. And for me, the taproot was with the Afro-Christian convention. The taproot was with the mothers and fathers who had a taproot that was rooted in Africa. All life is sacred. We believe in the community in terms of I am because you are. We believe that the spirit moves through everything. It's in and around everything. And we believe that God has allowed us to be free to witness. And we also know that there are others, not just us. Who belong to the community, yeah. not just us. That's the tap root out of which two years ago I started a journey with a number of folk and said, Hey, they've been telling uh, stories over, let me go way back though. It was when Carol Joyce Brown, the late bless her heart, who was secretary of the church at the time, said, Yvonne, I retired. And she said, Yvonne, this was uh, in 2000, I came out of Community Renewal Society in 1999 for retirement. I have been running all over the globe for freedom and justice, fighting against apartheid, fighting in this place. My body, body spirit was worn out. My, no, my, my knees were worn out. I was going to have to have new knees and everything. I had a stroke and everything. I've been fighting the powers and principalities, and it was having its impact on me. I was trying to be the woman for everybody and everything. You can't be the magnificent this for everybody and all of that without care for yourself and your body. I had to go home. I had a broken body, I had to go home. I've been roaming all around, been the first woman to be all day, yay, all off to uh, Geneva, where I was with the World Council of Churches, fighting against apartheid, yay, coming back to Chicago, fighting daily machine, daily machine, daily machine, yay, affirming women and everything, yay, and I had worn out. <laughs> Knees gone, stroke, 
and brain almost gone. I had to go home. Couldn't stay out in that thing. So I retired earlier than I thought I would because it was time for me to go home. And so I went home. Home was there for me to get myself back together again, feel loved again, care for me again, get my knees filled. When I go through the machines now, they say, I got artificial knees going on. Got an artificial shoulder going on. It sings all over the place. Yeah, the yeah. <laughs> they they be singing everything, but I'm here. Yeah. But you need to be the places where you got to be reminded of home again, where you can go back to the tap room. Because there was another assignment that wasn't through, and that was being elder. Mm -hmm. It was time for me to get ready to be elder, just as surely as they were preparing me for the journey. There's a time that is now time for you to be elder. And so it's coming out of that understanding that George Carol Just Burns said to me, hey, Iman, you need to be a part of the historical council. I said, not on your life. <laughs> not on your life. I know who those folk are. They're sitting up there trying to preserve a history and talking about a narrative that is really alien to where I am. I'm not going up there to the historical <laughs> council. I'm an activist, I said. All my work has been with justice and freedom and wholeness. I was head of the Office for Church and Society. I've been moving all around. Put me to work at justice mode. Do not be asking me to come up here and sit with folk who trying to remember a history that, in fact, is giving no life to the present. I'm not mm, coming. Wow. Mm. But Carol Choice said, mm -hmm. Yvonne, you need to be mm -hmm. with all that you are and mm -hmm. all you just said. Mm -hmm. Your role. Your role, Plymouth. Mm -hmm. Your role. I said, say what? <laughs> she said, yeah. She said, yeah. When the word of truth is spoken, that connects to all your experiences that say to you again you got a call mm -hmm. it flows through everything yeah. moves back into your mind my body has now been restored my mind is good i'm ready now for this new assignment and i'm now an elder mm -hmm. so i can't think like when i was running around mm -hmm. then assignments do change yeah mm -hmm. assignments do change mm -hmm. you got to get ready for your next assignment yeah. So I had to start thinking about what it meant for me to be an elder. And the place I put myself as an elder was different. Mm -hmm. But I still got the tap room. Mm -hmm. yep, yep, yep. I still got the tap room. And I had to be in that place as an elder because at that moment, this church had to be remembered. Mm -hmm. Hey, mm -hmm. I stood for president of this church. In 1989, yeah. I put my name up against Paul Sherry. I ain't have a prayer against it, but I was standing there wow. as a candidate, and I had a whole team of folk running around trying to get me elected. Yvonne Delp button for president. So I still got my president button. I'm standing there. I'm standing there in the midst of it. I got to go to every conference and make my case for why I should lead this denomination in 1989. Wow. Ain't had a prayer. <laughs> Moved all around, but I still got a significant number of folks. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. And I got folks who write to me today because I was so proud to work with you to stand on the floor of the 1989 General Senate for president, mm -hmm. Afro Christian Convention, mm -hmm. all of that, President Yvonne Dell. Mm -hmm. Bless his heart. <laughs> you know what? Um, Paul Sherry said to me when I went to his room that night to say, I'm going to put my name in. Because they had looked at me and said, no, we don't want you to be president. We don't want you to be cho chosen. Because uh, that's how it worked. They looked at me. Right. And, but at that time, there was a loophole that you could be still nominated from the floor of the General Senate. Oh. <laughs> After I stood, they closed the loophole. Uh -huh. <laughs> I know about that. They, said, know. they didn't understand that. They said, we're closing this loophole. <laughs> but at any rate, at that time, there was the loophole yeah. that you could be nominated from the floor. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then she said, did you see what we got? But we said you could be nominated from the floor. Something that's coming up out of our no, thinking that they still are yes. We have already said no to them, and they think they still got yes in them, too. So at, in, the, in the context of that, Paul said this to me, Yvonne, rather than to receive me with what in the world do you think you're doing? He said, do you think we could go to the Senate and say we both want to share the position? I love Paul Sherry. 
Bless his heart. No, he started thinking. He said, the church needs you just like it needs me. Maybe we could go. I said, Paul, and in a prayer, that we could go before this Senate. Yeah. And said, the two of us have decided that we're going to be co-leaders of this denomination. Mm -hmm. This will throw the whole thing into chaos, really. Mm -hmm. But I love you for thinking about it. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. He said, I need you. You hear what I'm saying? Yes. I know who you are. I know what's in you. I see that. This church needs I need mean, He offered, you see, amazing. Well, of course, we didn't do that. We learned I was not selected. Paul Sherry was and became president uh, of the church. But it was much later that end of this week, I'll be going to Cleveland. Yes. And I'll be in prayer. Mm -hmm. The oil installation prayer of one here in Georgia, Thompson. That's, That's right. right. In due time. Oh, that's good. right. Yes. Oh, in due season. Mm -hmm. Good. That's right. Mm -hmm. That moment is connected to another moment. We have a connected consciousness. You that's see, right. It moves mm -hmm. like this. And if you understood. So when Carl Jones asked me to step in, there was a call that I had to receive as an elder now. You got a story to protect. You got a history to protect. You got a name to protect. It is now your time to move into the channels of history and rewrite it. That's right. Re our I G H T, write it. And re W I R I T. Carl Braun understood that. How in the world is that possible? Because the way that the spirit moves, yeah. it still moves through in different places. Mm -hmm. She understood it. I said to her, okay, I go into the historical council and I start talking about the Afro-Christian convention and it flows like water going over and around. But yeah. what you, where is it? What's the written word? Document it, prove it. You know, all the, I mean, where is this thing? You know, it's a story. Well, yeah, but it's scattered. It's got places. It's, well, what? Okay. Not allowed. All right. Robert Brown Zingman. Yeah. goes to hidden history. She said, it ain't been absent all this time. I wrote about it. Historian, Robert Brown Jim. Right. Over the book, mm -hmm. Hidden Histories of the mm -hmm. United That's Church right. of Christ. Right there, right? Went to it. Herschel Austin article, Afro-Christian connection. All right. Yeah. It becomes the mandate. We duplicate all of that. Thank you, Barbara Brown Zingman. She's sitting at the table. <laughs> Who else is at the table? Richard Taylor, historian from the Christian... I mean, who is documenting the whole Christian connection to these United Church of Christ? Richard Taylor. He said, Yvonne, I got a lot of information you need to say. I've been keeping the record <laughs> on the Afro Christian Convention. <laughs> well, hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. If a way is made for you, the table will be set before you. Mm. But you got to step. You hear what I'm saying? You got to step. And rearrange. Robert Brown Zygmunt, versus Hart, then it went to all the archives and all. Because we are intellectual, we got to, in fact, see it in the written word that this was really happening. Although I'm saying, I'm here, and we got all these churches that are here. This ought to be enough. But in any way, we had to put it together in a written way. And as we did, I said to them, I said, well, historical council, you can't stay here. You can't feel the Afro-Christian convention in Cleveland. You got to go to my home in Whitaker's, North Carolina, to the home where the mothers and fathers of the Afro-Christian Convention coming right out of enslavement. Mm -hmm. After they built the churches, the first thing they did, we need a school first. They had it in the churches. Come on. We got to get ready to survive. That's right. Intellectual. And they started, and they said, we're raising money for a school. We're going to build this school. Franklinton, we're going to build this school. They pulled, they taxed every member 10 cents a member going for the school, going for the school. Everybody put their monies in, still didn't have enough. They said, well, we're going to send it out to the whole Christian church now. We need some help with this. Let's send it out to all of them, white and black, anybody said, we tried. So as the AMA developed their school, the Afro-Christian Convention also developed it. Mm. And with, in Bricks, North Carolina, there was a school that they made. In Franklin, North Carolina, there is a school from the Christian, Afro-Christian mm. boy. Mm. There was a college. Everybody came because we needed children, everybody. Then it was a college to change our ministers in. Then it was a college to help us to get ourselves to do it. 
the college rose along with the churches. That school, the Afro Christian College in Franklinton, North Carolina, in the 50s was closed. Well, it really was closed in the late 30s. But eventually it joined with the school that was in bricks, that the AMA. So you had two streams, AMA and then the Christian coming together in 1950 to create Franklinton Center at Bricks. Both of them with deep educational roots, but now we're training and equipping our pastors, our laity, our youth, all of it still focused on the black community, all still and engaged in Franklin Center at Bricks. That's where the lifeline was still there, the lifeline. And now we're on a plantation that has been changed for being a plantation through the AMA piece now into being a school. The AMA did that, they invaded that plantation. I mean, the, the guy said, look, you know, uh, we, at first, the guy who came to try to, after the Civil War, he was the one that came through first. A guy came through, they fought the Civil War, and of course, we know how that ended. And then this general from the North who had been there said, I'm going back to the South, and I'm going to create uh, a, a farm, and it's going to be really open, you know, we're not going to, we're going to invite everybody, I'm going to do it different. I'm going to do it like they were doing it. So here was this general from the North who had fought and won. Wanted to come back and take a farm, came, he didn't know nothing about farming. <laughs> One year after in, no results, because <laughs> he don't know nothing about farming. The farm ain't producing, nothing is happening. He's going bankrupt himself, much less going to help somebody else. He couldn't help himself. <laughs> and so he said, he went back to the lady who gave him the money. Her name was Miss Briggs in the North. She said, Miss Briggs, I'm giving you back your land because I tried it, it won't work, I can't do it. I'm giving it back to you. Ms. Briggs is an abolitionist. She said, well, thank you. And I'm going to give this land to someone who can resurrect a school. It ain't intended to be farming anymore. I want a school there. She knew about the AMA. She picked up a phone. She called some folks who were connected to the AMA. She said, I got a piece of land. I'm going to give you if you're willing to take it. And they did. And they, of course, developed an academy there. That was also a school. We got the one in Franklin, Afro-Christian AMA got the one given to them by Ms. Brick. And we are both parallel in the same state, one in Bricks, we in Franklin. And moving along this, and then in the 50s, now they're getting ready for the United Church of Christ. As you go, I will now begin to wrap up. <laughs> I will now begin to wrap up. My basic piece is to say this. But the book that we've written about is a book that is connected to that history. Mm -hmm. The overarching themes of it, I believe, are themes that are relevant for what it means for us to be on the task for being a beloved community today. And it's my feeling, because we were able to bring the whole Historical Council to Franklin and Center, they were able to reconnect at a different level, and which enabled them uh, last year to say, hey, there has always been a fifth stream flowing in on that. And there was the historical council that, in fact, affirmed it. Bless uh, uh, the president's heart. Uh, he, in fact, at our last general senate, made an apology and relationship. And we have the book now that we have, thanks to Tracy Blackman, that is moving in mm -hmm. and around uh, for it. And in it are the truths that I've been talking about, mm -hmm. a way of living that I've been talking about, that I think has important affirmations for us, because this is still a strange and alien land that we're living in. Yes. And if anything is happening, we're regressing. We're not moving forward. Right. We're, we're bowing before the worst instincts rather than the best. And yet, there are those who are still fighting for the vision that was created. Next year will be the 250th anniversary of the independence, United States independence. And there are groups, freedom groups, black and white all over the place, that are trying to bring us back to the vision that we have, we have. That's gonna mean reparation, all of this stuff is all in it. But there are still those who believe in that vision. We are one, that we will be flowing uh, in that midst with what it means to be the beloved community. And remember, the beloved community is composed of two things, love and justice. That's right. That's what love and justice, that's what Michael said too, love right. and justice. Love part of it is what we got to work on. Because people who don't love themselves can't accept love. People who are on domination mode can't love others. Right. So the love part 
we got to work on, and we got to work on the justice. We got to restore what has been taken in many ways. And so those are the two pieces. So I'm sorry, I didn't think I would go for it. I said it was a dialogue, <laughs> and now I have sucked up all the air in the room, haven't I not? Well, I wouldn't know that. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I think you witnessing in the spirit, and when right. the spirit uh -huh. is present, right. one has to be obedient. <laughs> and we want to thank you for holding up this history and uh, this vision and for uh, showing us one of the forms that repair or reparations can take. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we haven't even talked about how the United Church of Christ and Linda Jaramillo worked with the Franklinton Center to so make a repair. Ways. So many. And you have repaired the historical narrative. So when we start thinking about reparations, sometimes we can think about a check, but maybe that's not the repair, the form the repair needs to take. And indeed, conversations can be repaired. So we will continue to dialogue with you. And now we have some good things to eat. <laughs> and perhaps the conversation can continue. Well, in a small I, I need way. some feedback. So I'm hoping that even as we. Yeah. Uh, get our food, we can come back and do more than one thing at the same time. And I just need to hear, based on having sat here in this circle as an elder here and sharing all of that that I have shared, I just need to hear from you. So what? How does that connect at all to what's happening here? Mm -hmm. How does that connect at all to what we're trying to do here? I know very much from my home heart, heart that a part of my job is to be standing with the sons and daughters that we have kicked out in the Afro-Christian tradition as well. Sometimes when you stray from your roots, you lose your sense of grounding. Mm -hmm. And now our sons and daughters who are lesbian and gay and bisexual and trans, because they don't look exactly like what we think we ought to. And because we have doubled down in some, they have had to leave home. Yeah. Well, I'm the elder, again, among other elders, I'm the only one, and my job is to say, yeah, you got a home. That's right. You got a home. So let's and my job to say to the very church that came up out of, now they're doubling down on the question themselves. And so it is my job to speak truth to them. Come on, it's not only the do so care. If, if we may, we could take a, a break for uh, yeah. some nourishment and then come back to this question, which is central to the core of the work of the Braxton Institute and close to my heart as a non-binary human being. Uh, and certainly I do believe that you're making a way for uh, women in the United Church of Christ began to make a way for all of us. So let's come back to that very important We got some question. time that we can still do some dialogue? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we, we hadn't organized it exactly okay. that way. Okay. We had organized that conversation okay. for a smaller group to be taken. Okay. But uh, again, I'll confer with um, Dr. Yeah, Brown. Yeah, we'll, we'll work it out. And, okay. And we'll, we'll, if we can have just a little bit of time just yeah. so that... Sure. Yeah, because I got things I need to say. All right, yeah. good. Yeah, we all yeah. do. Yeah. 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 Yeah.